Well, good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. It is great to see who the brave ones really are out there, too. That's awesome. Way to go. Proud of you. And for those sitting at home on your couch with your coffee, I'm proud of you, too, for tuning in and checking us out. Uh, I know a lot of people are doing that, and for a lot of good reasons, too. And so we welcome them here as well. Um, this is a, an opportunity we're going to have now to um, spend a few weeks together and go through a sermon series called Label, looking at our, a little bit about our identity, how do we label ourselves, where do we find our value, where do we find our worth, and uh, how, do we, how do we build our life on those things. And so I thought as we're heading into a new year, and this is the New Year's Eve time, it's a great time to stop. Uh, it's a good time always where we reflect back, right? And we look at what's going on. We take a closer look sometimes at our life. We ask ourselves maybe a little bit harder questions um, before we continue to go on in the future. And so that's what this series really is going to help us do. And so hopefully we can do a little bit of that here today. I actually uh, put in your bulletin there, there's some notes, sermon notes for those that love to do that checking and filling out stuff. So they're in there. If you don't have one and you can't handle the fact that someone does and you don't, um, then you can go to the back and the ushers will make sure they get you one and you can follow along um, that way today. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you so much for your presence that you promised to us. As you said when we gather together, we lift up your name, Jesus, today, that you would be in our midst. So, Heavenly Father, as we come before you, as we come before your truth, before your word, we lay ourselves before you, and we ask that you would do your work, which is transforming and shaping our hearts, our character. And so we look forward to what you're going to say to us today. May we hear what is from you today and everything else just fall away. And may we encounter you in a new and fresh way as we look forward to the year coming ahead. In Jesus' name, Pray these things. Amen. Well, hello. My name is Sean. In case you didn't know that already, that's one of the labels I carry. It's one of the ones that I have been given and uh, I chose to accept, I guess, at some point when I was a kid to not deny what my parents called me but live into that. And that's one of the things that I'm labeled. But I, as I was thinking about labels and I was thinking about the different ways that uh, I'm, some people put on me, there's labels that people put on me, um, there's labels that I choose actually for myself, and we kind of live in this whole tension of labels. And as I started thinking about what are some of the roles and, and, and relationships and things that people have said about me or um, that are good, that are bad, my character issues or things that I do and how, how many different ways am I known out there and I know myself as. And I, I actually got really overwhelmed because I, what I, I did that I put in your notes there is that if you have a chance, I want you to start writing down what are some of the key ways that you feel defined. In other words, the ways that you're labeled. Some of those have happened to you. Sometimes people have said things about you or to you when you were little and you just can't shake it. There's things that you stuck and you wish would go away. Or maybe there's labels that you have chosen and that you long for to become more real in your life. Or there's roles that you play or there's hopes and dreams that you have. But there's just so many ways that we can be referred to. I was thinking about how to how to explain who I am, and so I was looking at labels, and I thought all the different ways that I could really be referred to where I'm labeled. I'm married, and so I can look at my marriage, and I can assess, is that a yuck? Is that a okay? Or is that I'm doing great? And, uh, and I carry that weight around. This morning, I took the warm car out of the garage and left the cold one behind for my wife to come here, so I'm not sure how she'll mark that one. I won't look later. But I I'm married, and so it's one of the ways I'm labeled. I'm also a father. I got some kids. I got three teenagers, and I'm a son. I have parents, and I'm a pastor's kid, and that one to me has always been kind of, ugh. it's one of those ones that I got, I never wanted, I always didn't like, I tried to run away from, I didn't you know, want to talk about it at school or anything like that. Um, I'm a brother, and sometimes I'm doing okay, she says, sometimes, eh, sometimes, hey, I remember her birthday, like last month I didn't, but 
but um, you know, I'm a grandson, I'm a friend, I'm a, I found out I am a pet parent a week ago. Um, I thought I was a pet owner, but apparently I'm a pet parent. And I found that out when my pet got sick and we had to take the pet to the vet. And uh, I didn't know what that meant, but there's pet parent parking and that was my first clue. The next thing that I realized is that being a pet parent simply just means you have to spend a lot of money. So, <laughs> for the record, I said the dog was just crazy, and after blood tests, ultrasounds, and everything else, by the way, the diagnosis is my dog is just crazy. So, <laughs> talk more about my other pet next week. Um, so I have, these, I have these things, a lot of them are relationships, right? I'm a co-worker, um, some people call me, it's weird, this time of the year when I get around to taxes, I'm clergy, I have this label, the government likes to call me clergy, I don't even know what that means, but if I if I'm get really serious, some people call me reverend, that's somewhere in here. Um, I'm a fill-in speaker guy, there's that one right there. In fact, I just have a lot, and it's really overwhelming because each one of these I find I can start to evaluate myself, right? Like, how am I doing on these? You know, am I a good boss? There's a boss. I'm a leader. Am I a good leader? Am I a counselor? I'm not a good counselor. Don't come to me. Um, I tell people that. They still, they, they say, no, I think, I, I think you'll be okay. And I tell them I'm not. And they find out I'm right. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I'm an athlete, I'm a neighbor, I'm, I'm a coach, I've been a coach, I like coaching, I'm a teacher, I'm a pastor. I, it's not a, I'm not a fan of that label, actually. It's something that, it's because when I grew up, people always said, are you going to be a pastor? I said, no, I'm absolutely not going to be a pastor. And I stuck with that for many years. So every time I'm called pastor, I remember I wasn't true to my own desires and wants, but I catered, or I, I don't feel I have the gifts of a pastor, and so I had a, a co-worker say to me the other day, why do you not like pastor? Don't you know that pastor is your core identity? And I went, ugh, no, and I glared at him, and I became a bad co-worker, and I walked away. Um, I, I'm a preacher, I'm, you know, I'm a Christian, that one's hard, I mean, it's one of those things that everyone has an idea of what that would mean. So when you tell maybe you're a Christian, it's like sometimes they're like, oh, they think they know you and they know what you like and what you hate and what you stand against and what you won't talk. It's just one of those labels now that I wish I could get rid of. I do, actually. I try to call myself a Jesus follower now. I try to eliminate Christian if I can. I'm Canadian. You might need to hang on to that one if you're going to the Middle East anytime soon. That will save your butt there for sure. Um, I'm a customer. I'm male. That's important now, so I better I wear that one. I am male. Um, I'm young and I'm old. I, I have this weird group that I go to. It's a men's group. We play squash. And they say the darnest things and we get in the, in, the, in the box. And there's four of us and there's several guys older than me and several guys younger than me. I shouldn't say several older. That's just my wanting to be the young guy. But they'll get in the room and they often say this horrible thing like old guys versus young guys. And I have to check. I look around to figure out which one I am. And sometimes it's, yes, I'm one of the young guys. I'm the young guys versus the old guys. Most of the time now, I'm the old guys versus the young guys. It's horrible. Um, I am an INTP. Myers-Briggs gives me a label. It's great. I get to wear that. I can blame how I am, how I think, how I feel, how I treat people, all on that. It's, it's a great label to pull out in times when you want to get away from people. You say, I'm an introvert. That's, that's me. Just back up. Um, it's a good one. I'm a shorty. And you see, that label for some people is like, you know you're not. I am. I'm a shorty. I grew up, I was called a shorty. I was called a short kid. And I am the shortest male in my entire family on both sides, including my dad and all my cousins. Like, I'm it. I mean, they're 6'8", 6 6'6", 6 6 6 I'm six feet tall, and I'm shorty. But it's the label I have. I've been called a geek because I was, I was in band. I, so I was the geek. I've been called, I have an attitude. I got, um, I'm the fit guy sometimes. I'm the religious fit guy sometimes. Um, I've been a bench warmer. I got named that. Man of the Cloth was a really weird nickname someone gave me. He used to wear a Harley Davidson and, and, and jacket, and he was just a scary looking biker dude. And he found out I was in Bible school. And so every time he saw me, he said, Man of the Cloth. And then. I had to see him like five times a day because I delivered parts to him, and he literally did that every time. Um, I found out I'm rich. I, we had a kid visit our home once, and it was something we never thought we were, and some kid said, are you rich or what? And I was like, 
I'm rich. I am. I guess I am. I, I'm lots of these things, you know. I, sometimes people call me strategic, or I'm sarcastic, or I'm just average. Um, I've been called fat. I've been called skinny. I've been called rebellious. I don't mind that one. I like it a little bit. Um, driven, grumpy, rude. I can be called critical, or sometimes I've been called stupid. I've been called an idiot. I've been called a control freak, arrogant. I, I got lots of labels, and, and it's just overwhelming. And, and if, if you're like me, and you spent too much time this week, and you started realizing all the things that you carry on you. It, it, it's, it's a lot. And what we tend to do is that we live in this tension of there's certain ones that we are clinging for, that we like, that we try to keep feeling good, that we, we find our value in. And, and then there's some that people put on us <laughs> and we spend an entire lifetime trying to get it off. Well, you know, every day we wake up trying to prove that the label that that teacher or that parent or that coach or that friend, that, that person who we cared about said to us, and we're so desperate to prove that label wrong that it drives and motivates us. Some of us, we don't have the label yet, but we're just so, so desperate to get it. Oh, to be married and married people, you know, oh, to be single. <laughs> um, some people, you know, like, or to have kids, or I wish, wait till the kids I want to be, you know, empty nest person. And so there's different labels, and it's funny because we all want different things, but there's this tension. There's things that we want, and there's things that we find value in, and then there's things that are put on us that we can't shake and we can't get away from. And so we're going to talk about that for a few weeks. What does the Bible have to say about who we are really? Do you know who you are really? What I find interesting is that often when we're looking at these things, sometimes when we feel like we're failing in one of them, we just decide to focus on another one. So if I feel like my marriage isn't going so well, then I just think I'm just going to be super leader. I'm just going to be awesome or I'm going to be a great boss. You know what, I'm going to be the best co-worker. Or if, or if work's not going really well, then I, I, I press in somewhere else and I, I'm going to be rich. <laughs> or I, you know what, I'm going to just be an athlete. I'm going to be fit. And that's where I'll find my significance. But we, we sit there and we search, which of these, which of these is important to me? And, and sometimes even it's important, but it's not working out for us. So we, we just think I got to switch and I got to find something else because there's something desperate inside of all of us to feel a sense of value and worth from outside of ourselves, from another that we can experience and press into. So the question is, who are you really? Where do you find your biggest value from? What are you hoping in these labels? Or the, maybe the label you don't yet have, but you want to find your significance in. I, I want to read to you a passage of scripture found in, uh, it's found in two places. It's in the book of Matthew and in the book of Luke. And Luke chapter 6, I'll put it on the, the screen for you. Jesus talks to the people who are listening to him, and he's saying, I, I want to show you what it's like when someone comes to me and listens to my teaching and then follows it. I, I want to show you what it would look like if you were to listen to God's view of you, if you were to understand what I say is truth about who you really are. So when someone listens to it and follows it, in other words, they press into that, they, they allow that to be the foundation. He says, it's like a person who's going to build a house, and, and he digs deep down, and he lays a foundation on solid rock. Now, I like to build things quick. I don't like building foundational stuff. Every time I go to build something, like a deck or do something, or I just think, how quick can I get this up? Because foundational work is tough work. It's long work. Getting down to the hard, the bedrock. And the problem with foundational work is it takes a really long time before you can start building and see results. 
And, uh, you know, so it's just extra, extra work. But Jesus says, a person who, who puts, puts what I say about them or about how life works and, and actually digs it down, takes the time to make sure that they understand and they truly trust that, that they can build a foundation that is, that's solid and it's on rock. When the floodgates and the waters rise and they come up against that house, that foundation, that house, it'll stand firm because it's well built. It's, it's on the rock. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground without any foundation. When the flood sweeps down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. I was uh, just in Haiti in, in uh, November. Been to Haiti five times since the earthquake, the big earthquake there. Since then, they've had several storms. Or, you know, they, they experienced in that earthquake, though, nothing like the storms since. And, and I, I think in the earthquake, somewhere around, they don't even know the total. 600,000 people lost their lives. The thing about Haiti is they, they, they knew that there was storms sometimes. They knew that there would be wind and tropical storms. That happens off enough. What they, they didn't see coming was the earthquake. <laughs> they didn't see that the ground one day would actually start to shake and shift the way it did. And so the reason why the, the numbers of people died in Haiti and, and the, the reason why it was so devastating was because of the way they built. They, they, they would simply kind of scrape the top of the surface like Jesus just said. They'd scrape it off and they would take rocks and they would take some mud and mix cement and they would build this, this top foundation piece on top of the dirt. And then they would level that off. And then they would get bricks. And they would begin to build the walls. In, in third and fourth world countries, I saw this in, in Israel, you see it in Egypt, you see it in, in places in Africa, you see it everywhere and see it in Haiti. What typically they do is they don't have a whole lot of money, so they, they, they want the foundation to actually be cheap. It's got to be cheap so they can start building because the need for a house is, is quite, quite large. They need a house. And it would cost a lot of money and take a lot of time to dig, dig deep. And it's probably not necessary because they've never had an earthquake before. So they would build. And, and if you go to these kind of countries, you'll notice that at the top of every building, there's, there's rebar that sticks out of the building into the air. I don't know if you've ever seen that before. And if you always inquire, well, what is that? Well, that's, that's in case uh, things expand and grow. So their families grow or things go well and they get more money or more resources, they can start to, to build another level. And so this is what would happen in a place like Haiti is that they would, they would build on this foundation and that would be fine for a while because it was a small little, little building. But then as things grow and as if as the economy went well or they're able to sell some things or they got kids or they got married and things expand, the next generation, they'd have to build another room on top of the other room. And, Land's expensive, but they could build up. And so in these places, even like Egypt, you'll see that they build up and up. And every time it goes up, they leave rebar in case they need to build some more. And that's why so many people lost their lives is because these buildings had been built and the weight was so strong resting on this simple crumbly concrete and rocks that when the ground shifted, when it moved to the side, the rocks would crumble and fall and break away from the mortar and these walls would simply crash down on top of the people. It's horrific. Jesus says it's kind of like that with us too. If we don't take the time to understand the foundation of life or who we are really, and we're just quick to build and quick to expand, it's one of the things we, we pray for even in the Christian church. It's one of the things that, you know, sells the most of books and 
you know, and we claim all these promises of God, that God would prosper us and grow and expand our business and expand our influence and expand our family. It's great, and there's nothing wrong with wanting that, but the problem is if we keep expanding and we keep building and we keep making things bigger and better, and, and that's what we, we all think we're supposed to do in the society, is make it better and, and move our, our career ahead and move our family ahead and move everything ahead. The problem is we keep building, but if the foundation actually isn't strong, when, when the earthquake or the storms come and things shift on us, all of it will collapse with a great big crash. Some of you have gone through last year and that's what happened. Or maybe you're just seeing the cracks and you're looking at some of these things that you've actually valued and you hung on to. Some of them had just been completely wiped away. Maybe it was a friend that betrayed you. Maybe it's a marriage that completely collapsed. Maybe you lost a father or a mother. And these things that gave you a sense of value and a sense of worth, maybe it was your career that you were the boss or you were the leader and all of a sudden you're fired or, or worse, you're facing retirement and you never expected it. And you had built you had all this this life, all this value, all this importance of everything, you built it on that foundation. You built it on your marriage and your marriage fell down. You built it on your friends and your friends left and betrayed you. You built it on the girlfriend and she ditched you. You built it on all these things. You built it as an athlete that you could be fit and you got hurt and you got sick and now there's, there's nothing. And you begin to ask yourself, what value can I have? You built it on being a mother and all of a sudden your kids don't need you anymore because they've grown up. You built it on your career and your career is gone. You built it on your health and now you're sick. When Jesus talks this way, he, he specifically says when. <laughs> he doesn't say if. I don't know anybody that's gone through a substantial time of life where they haven't hit the storms. And maybe that was 2017, and, and I've seen so many people on Facebook of lots of funny memes I can't even show you, but, you know, like a bag burning with 2017 on it, and like, yay! And, and you know, we just get so excited about, sometimes it's like, oh, that year's behind me, you know. <laughs> 2018, and it's like we're just about to go off and build a whole nother building. And we get excited, because we like new. New is always better. That's our generation. The old generation was, old is always better. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But that's not us. That's not me. New is better. You tell me it's new. iPhone, what is it? New one? It's better. It's got to be. I trust that. So new is always better. And so we're about to head into a new year. And some of you are so excited that you can scratch that year off. And you're about to go build new relationships, new things, new careers. You're so excited. But I, I want to pause, though. Wait a second. Before you scrape the ground and start laying some new bricks. What are you building it on? Because these things actually don't last. None of these things are reliable. A storm can take out any of these things at any time. And so we can lose our value, our purpose, our meaning, our substance, if we build on one of these, a great house. So what do, we, what do we do? Well, some of us, when we're dissatisfied in life, we, we run off to someone that can make us achieve big dreams, do better, get better, leave behind, let it go, press ahead. And uh, I got to admit, I was curious and hear Tony Robbins is coming to come into the area and everyone on Facebook talking about them and they're so pumped and got their tickets and they're excited and, and I thought, you know, and then someone posted on Facebook the amazing talk he gave on how to find out who you are and I thought, I'm preaching on this. I can just listen to him and then I can just take what he said. That'd be awesome. He's gonna solve my problems. But what I found was the foundation was all on that person's own desires of feeling significant. And as I listened, I got really worried. 
I thought, man, there's people out there and they, they're just gonna go build a new house because of this guy. You know, that something's broke and the relationship's broke and he just says, you know what? Let it go. Don't carry it with you. You can find another. You can find another marriage. You can find another career. You can find another job. You can find value. You can find meaning. What you need to do is you gotta learn to stop, stop counting on that label. You need to, this isn't working out for you anymore. Then let it go. Just go build another house. You can do it. And I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, but everything that he was saying to build on was another thing that could be taken out in a storm. How, how could we know that that's going to be secure? What's going to happen if that doesn't work out? And, and so one of the ladies that he was working with, um, she was saying how depressed and, 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 and she was feeling not valuable and not significant. And as he was talking to her, he said, well, I don't understand. You're successful. You're rich. You have friends. You're famous. You got everything, all these labels that so many people want. I don't understand. She said, yes, but there's just one. There's one right here. There's one right here. It's that I want to be a parent. And I can't have kids. And if I can't have kids, I don't think I'm valuable. Well, that's okay, he said. What we can do, we can adopt kids. She said, no, no, I don't think so. I want, I want like my own kids for my own blood because I, I want somebody in my life that won't leave me, won't betray me. They'll always be there for me. I want unconditional love. And you know what he said? Sorry, I don't mean to, I, I do mean to bash him. Sorry. I, I, he's got some good stuff, okay? Here and there. He said, I can help you with that. I went, oh, this is where the gospel comes in. We can build a different relationship with unconditional love. Why don't we find you some good friends? We'll just, we'll just forget that one. Forget that. That script's not going to work for you. You can't have kids. That's the only thing that makes you valuable. That won't make you valuable. Here, here, your friend. Let's find you some really good friends. And I'm going, will that work? What if you found some friends that could love you unconditionally? Yeah, I just want to be loved unconditionally. I thought, wait a second. Who says they want to be her friend? Maybe she's a lousy friend. I'm not a great friend. I mean, I, friendship is hard for me. What happens if this friend betrays her and leaves her? You just built another house based upon someone else saying that you're good enough. Are you crazy? This is what you're going to give them as a new foundation for their new meaning, a new value in life? And then, and then he talked about a basketball player that he was able to help because he found value and appreciation from, from playing basketball. And when he played basketball, the, the crowds and the, his family and his relatives were so proud of him and he felt affirmed and valuable, important. And you probably know what happened. He had built his whole foundation on that and he got in a car accident. And so he was there trying to figure out, what do I do? I don't feel valuable anymore. I don't feel significant. I don't know how to find success and meaning in life. Oh, what we got to do is find you another, another way to get affirmation. He said, I could help him. So I said, why don't you coach basketball? Oh, coach, I've done that. Here, I can be a coach, coach. And it was great, and I got him coaching, and kids affirmed him. The kids liked him, and I thought, what if he's a lousy coach? And by the way, there's a day coming when he probably won't be a good coach anymore. And what if the next class doesn't like him, or what if that whole thing doesn't pan out? You're just going to build a whole nother existence and a whole nother value system on something else that can be taken away. I, I'm confused. We need to look at this because we don't mean to do this, I think, a lot of us. But we do this. We build our value, our, our identity, our self-worth on these things that are all movable and shakable. And when we put as much weight on them as that we, we want to, and things happen, we will look ourselves in the mirror one day and say, who am I if I'm not that anymore? If I'm not married, I don't know who I am. If my kids don't need me, I don't know who I am. If I can't work with my hands because my body is broke, I don't know who I am. If I'm retired and, and I can't contribute to work, who am I? If I'm a great hockey player, but I can't play hockey anymore, who am I? What if, what if, 
What if the truth is, I'm not actually who others say I am? What if I don't need other people to tell me where my value comes from? What would change for you to be at ease with yourself? To not need the 50 likes on Facebook to feel like you did something well? What would it mean if other people thought you weren't all that, but you could still be okay with who you are? What difference would that make? What if actually I'm not even who I think I am? I, if you're like me at all, you're, you're your number one critic, aren't you? And sometimes the reason why we're hanging on to what other people are saying about us so much is that when that stops and when that noise stops and when people stop applauding or stop telling us we're valuable or stop telling us we're important and we get alone and we're just alone with no distractions and we look in the mirror, how often do we actually like who we are? What if your value isn't based on whether or not you value yourself? What if I really am who God says I am? What if I really am who God says I am? What would change? We need to look at that for the next few weeks. Colossians chapter one says, through him, Jesus Christ, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. That means you, you're part of the everything. He made the things we can see. He made the things we can't see. Everything was created through him and for him. God made you for himself. God designed you for himself. When God created creation, it was that it would bring glory to him. Do you realize that he has crafted and he has shaped you and he has made you because who you are brings him glory? Psalm 139 says crazy things like, even before you breathed the first breath, he spent time with you. He shaped you. He molded you. He crafted you. He made you the way you are. He made you the way you look. He made you the way that you would respond. He made your personality. He made you. He saw every one of your days. And he talked to you. And he whispered to you that you are his. That is mind-blowing. And some of us, we, we say, well, I'm a Christian. So I know these things. It's one of my labels. The question is, is your identity and who God says you actually are a valued, cherished person who brings him pleasure and glory? Is that your primary identity? Is that what you're building your life on? Is that the foundation? Because that's the truth of God's worth. And no matter what else happens around you, whatever shakes, whatever crashes around you, if that was what you believed to the core of your being, that you trusted that this was true about you, everything else could fall down all around you. It's not that these things are bad things. These are okay things. It's great to have these labels. And there's some that I don't have that you have, and they're okay too. There's nothing wrong with these. They make great walls. Some are awesome decorations, you know. It's, it's good to have in your life. It's, they're healthy to have friends and have a, a job and to be a brother and all these things. And these are all awesome. There's nothing wrong with these things, but they make horrible, horrible foundations. Because when the storms of life happen, and some of you experienced it in 2017, and you would get up here and you would say, I had no idea of the storm that was coming in 2017. Who I thought I was, what I thought I cared about, what I thought I knew about myself was completely wiped away, and I don't know who I am today. I don't know if 2018 looks any better. Some of you are sitting here today and you're going, now last year was an awesome year. Everything looks bright and shiny coming up in 2018. But I want you to know there's some of you who think that way that you're going to face things in 2018 that you have no idea about today. And if you're building on the wrong foundation, 
the core of your value and who you are is at risk. Ephesians chapter 4 said this, before, even before God made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy without fault in his eyes. In other words, before the world was created, God saw us and he decided that we would be the object that he loved, that he would create us to reflect himself and be holy, that he chose us to have such meaning and purpose that we would display who he is to all the angels, all the angelic beings, all creation, that we would be a shining example of his character. That's what we were created to do. That is where your value and your purpose comes from. You were created to bring God glory. The thing is, what do I have to do? <laughs> what do I have to do? You don't do anything. Well, you are part of his creation. He shaped and created and crafted you in your mother's womb. And your existence brings him pleasure. I, I know, for me, this is hard stuff because I know it here. But for it to get here, where it becomes my true identity, because if that was my true identity, then I really believed it, and I would build on that foundation, then when these other things shake and they go, I would know that I am an object of God's love and desire, and he made me, and I bring pleasure to him because I just am. It says God decided in advance that he would adopt us. So it's not only in creation as a whole that humanity would be this, but then God decided in advance to adopt us into his family, that we wouldn't just be a creation, that we wouldn't just be out there, but that we would be adopted into a relationship to do life with him. He decided to do this through Jesus Christ. He decided to adopt us. It wasn't our choice. It wasn't something we desired. It's not something we asked for. He did it for us. He he died for us. He made a way for us to be in a relationship with us. He adopted us into his family. And Jesus reveals to us that we are his children through Jesus Christ. When Jesus came to earth, he came to reveal who God was. Do you know who he reveals who God is? Over a hundred times in just the gospel book of John. Jesus helps us understand that God is a father. That God is a father. Now for some of you, I know that you've not had good experiences with fathers. You haven't had a good father. Maybe your father wasn't even there. Your father was flawed. He's broken. And that isn't right. Because we're not to experience that. We're to experience all the things that a good father is. But here's the thing, that even if you experience the worst dad ever, I believe there's something deep inside of you that knows this. You know what a good father is. He couldn't take that from you. You know. So to call God a father, sometimes you have to get over that little hurdle of picturing that, but you know what a good father is. A good father is someone there for you. A good father protects you. A good father coaches you and guides you. He helps you. He comforts you. He gives you, actually, meaning and purpose. And the reason that I think Jesus revealed that God is our father in him, that we are adopted in his family, is that that is a position that we find ourselves in. It's a position of receiving love from him. It's not something you can earn. It's not something you chose. It's not something you did. All scripture says, this is simply what God decided to do and what God decide, desires for you to be in relationship with him. And so you can say to me, I don't care who God is. I am just got dragged here. I don't want to be here. I just blah, 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 blah. That's okay. Because you don't have to accept him back to be precious in his sight. He still crafted you, he still designed you, and he still longs for you, and he's wanting to adopt you into his family through Jesus Christ. You are still pleasing to him. 
That is really hard to get down to. But you know what? Here's what I find is interesting. Often, when I enjoy my kids the most, it's when they're actually doing nothing. I know that's tongue in cheek. But sometimes, I'll be in my office, and I haven't seen them for a few hours, and I have just good thoughts about my kids. Just because they're my kids. And I enjoy my kids. Sometimes I go home, and we interact, and I have those thoughts go. But, but basically, what I've found is that the love of a father is not actually about what they're doing or not doing. When they're little, and they, they stand up or they spit up, everyone cheers and takes pictures. You know, they, they draw something on the paper we don't know what it is but we put it on the fridge it's art their worth and their value is not about what they're producing or what they can do it's simply by relationship alone your value and your importance to your heavenly father is not about your performance record it's not about your past it's not about what you're going to accomplish in your future it's just because you are his it's amazing if that could get to the core of our being. What if you are? What if you actually are the one the Father loves? What if that was your identity? Scripture says it's true. That you might not follow him right now. Maybe you have nothing to do with God. It's okay. Scripture tells us you are the one he loves. They say, well, how do, we, how do we know that? Well, there's a great verse in the Bible that we've read many times before, maybe, or maybe you've heard about it. John 3, 16. But I, I put blanks in there for your notes because I want you to do something for me. I want you to put your name in there. So I want to read this, and I'm going to use my name, but I need you to use your own name because we, in the verse it says the world, and we, we get it. God loves the world. He loves other people. He loves people. God is love. We get all that stuff, but we have a really hard time taking that concept that is large and big and looking in the mirror and saying, I am the one that he loves. This is how we know the Father loves Sean. Put your name in there. This is how I know he loves me. He gave his one, his only son, so that when, Sean, when you believe in him, they will not perish, but they will have eternal life. The father sent his son into the world not to judge Sean. He didn't come here to judge you. He didn't come here to evaluate how you're doing how you're knocking it out of the park or you're failing. But to save, Sean, to save you through himself. What would it look like if that was your core identity? First John 1 says, see how much the Father loves you. He calls you his children. Jesus taught his disciples that if they wanted a relationship with the Father, then they needed to address him, Dad, Abba Father, which means Daddy. You can pray to him like that. You can call it to him because that's how he sees you. And he says, you know, for those people who are, are flawed and sinful people like myself, that if, you, if you know how a good father is and you know what to do as a good father, you know how to give good gifts to your kids, can you imagine what a holy and pure father would do, a good, good father would do for you? Can you imagine how much he loves if you're capable of it? You are the one the father loves. So the question of moving ahead this year is this, what will be your foundation? Some of these, they'll last for a while. I mean, you can build some pretty nice houses on some pretty lousy foundations. But when the storm comes and one of those gives way, where will your value be? You're more loved than you could possibly imagine today. Will you build your foundation in 2008 different on who God says you are. Not on who other people say you are, not on who you say you are, but on really 
who God says you are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is, it's hard for me. I get it in my head. I've read it. I hear it. It's hard for me to comprehend it. As the psalmist cries out in Psalm 8, who am I that this God Almighty would be mindful of me? Who am I? How could it be? How could it be that you would lavish such love on me? Heavenly Father, this is the truth of your word that you revealed to us. It's hard. It's hard to get into our being this way. But I pray that by your spirit, that you would help us understand how wide, how deep, how long is your love for us this year. That we would build, yes, we'd build relationships and we would build careers and we'd build in, into our roles and do excellent work. But Heavenly Father, that we would build it on the ultimate foundation of your love for us. Look forward to what you're gonna do in our lives this year. In Jesus' name, amen.